All right. Um, so uh, just to introduce myself, I'm the general manager for the what, what is Live Technologies flow cytometry and imaging business. And as I get into this, we'll talk a little bit about what we do just to introduce and it'll set up the theme for what we're, you know, what this site is about. It is an innovation site within Life Technologies and where I'm very proud of the, the, the R&D organization as well as the, you know, from a marketing perspective and the, and the manufacturing side as well because we innovate in a lot of areas and, and I think it's been uh, essential for our success over the last 25 or so years. So um, this is, as Victoria alluded to, the, the agenda for today. And you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about, and I have to admit that I did take liberally from uh, a talk that I saw by a gentleman called Jeff Dyer, who is, uh, let's just say, a, a colleague of uh, Clayton Christensen, who, who I think is, is really um, so at the forefront of this whole innovation side of things. So you'll see the innovator's DNA, which is really what this talk is about and actually it appealed to me when I listened to him speak uh, earlier this year and this is really where the talk is coming from because he talks about a number of traits or another number of attributes of innovators and actually when you boil it down it's about curiosity is, is what it is. So if just to introduce molecular probes we're fundamentally in the business of visualizing biology and we provide the reagents and instruments to, to do that and how we how we do that is through innovation and we've done that over now for the last 25 years and, and we're actually changing the business model from just being pure reagents to a, a systems play where we offer instruments as well. And actually the team has gotten very, very good at, at simplifying complicated uh, workflows and, and, and complicated instruments. We're actually, I would say we lead the company in that regard. The other area that we're actually now starting to expand into and we're investing is, is education and, and this is scientific education for people who have graduated and are working in labs. It's become very obvious to us that in, in certain, when our products uh, especially, they are complicated to use and we need to teach them about how to use them and, and that's an area where we're investing in. We're not shy about where we get our reagents from. We actually take from Mother Nature. So if for the more astute of you, this is, a, a, this is an Aquaria Victoria jellyfish, and that's where the green fluorescent protein comes from. And we, we use that as well as other fluorescent proteins. We take semiconductor nanocrystals, and then um, we also synthesize, we do a lot of organic chemistry as well here. So it doesn't matter. We're not shy about where we take from, but we innovate from a variety of sources. And really we're building on a legacy of, of um, innovation here. Uh, Dick Hoogland and his wife Rosaria first founded the company back in, in 1975. Interestingly, the names of the dyes that we use are pretty much correlate to where he set up shop. So Texas Red from when he moved to Texas. When he moved to Oregon, it became Oregon Green. And, and indeed, one of our biggest franchises is called the Alexa Floor Dye Series. Alexa is the name of um, his son, or Alex is the name of his son. We have other products, for example, uh, Cyber SY, Stephen Yu, the, the chemist who, uh, who invented the, the dye. So back in those days, marketing didn't exist, so the chemists had their way and, and named products after themselves. But we, um, you know, other things, for example, we have a xenon um, labeling kit where we can stick a dye on a particular protein, Xenon being his favorite cafe, Cafe Xenon downtown. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting as you learn all of these stories and as, you, as we've uh, developed over time. But what we started to do is, is introduce um, instrumentation and, and flow cytometry as an analytical instrument for looking at cell populations one at a time. And then we've also just recently, last year, acquired a microscope company up in uh, Bothell. And uh, you can see we're continuing with the naming AMG, if you're a car nut, it's, that's the performance brand of Mercedes. It also stands for Advanced Microscopy Group, the owner being a very uh, big car fan. So that's why he named it that way. But it, it, is, it is an interesting story and one that we've evolved. Um, this business now has grown from I think at this point when we purchased, it was purchased by Invitrogen, uh, at that point it, it, it was about 55, $55 million. I can tell you from there till now we've grown that to around $200 million. So it's, it's, a, it's a business that is growing very rapidly for life technologies. So when we think about innovation, there's three, three ways I look at innovation. Right? The first way is, is just 
looking at it from a growth innovation where you take a product that is complicated or a workflow that is, is uh, expensive or inconvenient and, and convert that into something that's simple, affordable and easy to use. These, these types of products, and I give examples on the next slide and, and I'll more at a consumer level, but I also would think for the, for the folks in the room who, from a life tech perspective, the Countess device, which is a cell counter, we converted what is a 20 minute workflow manually looking down a microscope, we converted that to a small, small, mic uh, small microscope, yes it is, a small little device that counts those cells in 30 seconds. I can tell you it was the fastest SKU ever launched out of Invitrogen. We made $11 million in the first year. Just, we sold a ton of these things. It was amazing how the, the market just really expanded on that. We actually created a new space within the market. We had a lot of fast followers after that. Sustaining innovations, are, these are the, the incremental side of things where you, software is a classic example, new features, Microsoft Office, that sort of thing. Every three or four years you get a bunch of new features you never use. And then um, the, the other side is where you change the business model, right? And, and this is something that we'll talk about as well in a second. And this is something that we've focused a lot on. This is something here where we're starting to look at innovation, particularly around using instruments as a channel for our reagents. So trying to change it up here a little bit in how we go about it. So one of the first, uh, you know, an example of innovation is this Chota crawl, which is a really interesting thing because I don't know if how many people have been to India and, and I, I, I went there uh, a year or so ago and just blew my mind how this, that place works. But one of the things you fast realize in India is electricity is not stable. You get a lot of brownouts, a lot of electricity failures. So you can't have a big Western style refrigerator because A, they, use, they have a compress compressor on them and they use a lot of electricity. And these, this is where it's all in the lid and it, it runs on battery, it runs on elect it uses mains electricity. Uh, simp simple to service, no compressor. So you actually send the lid back through the post office back to get it serviced and, and send it back. And because the other thing is Indian families, the way they shop is we would shop for a week. I know I do. You shop for a week because I hate going shopping, but they shop daily. So they don't need a large refrigerator. They just need something to keep the food for a day or so and then they move on. So that's an example of something where they've expanded um, greatly and they've actually innovated also on the business model as well with micro funding and so forth for uh, their, their dealers. An example of um, a sustaining would be obviously you know, moving from a plasma type or an LCD television to a 3D uh, TV. And I, I don't know about you, but I really don't like, uh, I, I just can't imagine buying a 3D television when I sit down in front of watching television. And then obviously the classic example of a business model transformation is, is how Amazon has transformed the book selling business and, and certainly has gone on and done more things since then. So that's an example around innovation, uh, the different types of innovation that you can have. And, and really what it comes down to is you need to do all three. You can't just rely on the first one or two. You need to do all three from an innovation perspective. So the question comes, and it's something that I've, you know, fascinated me over the years is about how do you manage innovation? How do you, you know, develop it uh, in a company? Because I often get told, well, you can't, you can't forecast innovation, you can't pressure it to happen. And, and so let's talk through a little bit about how it, uh, the attributes around the people, because the reality is we're in a knowledge business. And a knowledge business comes around and, and is driven by the people in the organization. So how do you hire creative, innovative people? And, and it's the attributes you need to look for. So what I keep telling folks here, and Victoria um, mentioned that uh, well, which is our job is to innovate. That's our primary job in this company right now is we need to innovate in this space and, and uh, drive the company and, the, and the, you know, the revenue forward. We're a public company and, and uh, well, we are for the next couple of months. And, um, and you know, at the end of the day, we'll be, uh, that, that's our job in here. So let's talk a little bit about a question. So I have a question for you. So is this true or false that your creativity, the genetics cr uh, trumps nurture um, when it comes to creativity? And it's an interesting question, right? It's the whole thing about intelligence testing. So we know that genetics is the predominant driver for your IQ score. That's, it's, it's roughly 80% or so of that. And so the question is, is it the same thing on um, creativity? Does genetics drive that? It's an interesting question. How many people think it's true or 
How many people think that's true, that genetics is the driver of creativity? Yeah? How many people false? Why do you think it's false? Because I know the life tech people have heard this before, but I guess the question is, um, you know, 80% of people, 80% of people in the US, when they were asked this question, said it was genetic. 80%. They're actually wrong. It's not. It's actually, when you look at it, the research shows you that when you look at twins, so that you then, you raise them apart, sometime between when they're 15 and 25, you give them a uh, intelligence and creativity test, and then you look at the results, it turns out that 80% of their IQ is, uh, score is due to genetics, but only a third of it is actually of their creativity is due to genetics. So we know that now it must be nurture that drives a lot of the creativity, which is a positive for us because it means it's a skill. And that means you can learn it and practice it and, and drive it forward. So we know it's not just genetic. And, and you know, you can think about this from a left, blank, a left brain, which is the more logical and then the more creative on the right side. So we know it's not genetic. So it means then that's the good news for us because we can actually all participate in that. And, and you know, we're just, as it's stating here, that roughly about a third of, of our creativity is due to nature and roughly two thirds is then due to the nurture aspect of it. So that's the second takeaway from this. We've all got more capacity to be creative than we think. So what makes someone a disruptive innovator? And, and these are classic examples of folks, you know, Jeff Bezos, we've got, you know, Steve Jobs and the crew and Meg Whitman here. I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, how do they get new ideas? And the question back is, if they can do it, why can't I? Well, let's think about what they've got um, that we may not practice that much. And, and one of them is this term associating. And it's a key attribute. Certainly Jeff Dyer talks about this from the, you know, his book, The DNA, uh, Innovator's DNA. Um, uh, he uses the term associating. A lot of other people would use this term lateral thinking, right brain thinking, all this good stuff. But at the end of the day, what it's about is, is how do you bring together seemingly unrelated ideas and connect them into a new, in, in, in new ways that give you a new breakthrough in your thinking. And so when you think about it, as Einstein said, we can't solve problems using the same thinking that got us into the, into the mess in the first place, right? So what we actually have to do is use that combinatorial play to bring different ideas together and try and see whether they can actually develop into something new. So associating is what we talked about is connecting seemingly unrelated ideas. Do, what do you think is the connection between these two things? This Jonathan Ives actually did this. This is true. This is a true story, right? So Jonathan Ives, who's the inventor of the iPod, along with Steve, is, was playing around with this padlock one day, and what he came up with was the dial. How to use the dial with your finger, and it came from him playing around with a padlock. And that's how he brought together two seemingly unrelated ideas and then used that to come up with a new product. So, Associating is clearly how some of these folks, you know, the, the so-called creative and innovative folks in this world do things. So what is the attributes? When we think through this, it's a cognitive skill. So that's something that we can practice and use. And when you, when you associate, you can come up with creative ideas. But what's the behaviors that actually drive that, right? And, and for science-trained folks, questioning, observing, experimenting, are things that we're all trained to do. From a scientific perspective, that's what we're trained to do. The fourth thing that a lot of people don't do is networking, which is one of the reasons why we're holding this today, is because networking with people outside your sphere of influence. Because talking with people that, um, that have a different experience, oftentimes will have encounter the same problems and have a different perspective. That's one of the things as scientists where we tend to train and work on our own stuff. We do a lot of this except for this. If you do this well, you usually go into marketing and then you forget about these three things. <laughs> That's usually what happens. So if we, um, let's go in and take a look at these a little bit differently. So Steve Jobs often said this whole thing, you know, think different to act different. Actually, it's the other way around. 
you've got to act different to be able to think different. And that means practicing your, your behavioral skills to actually drive your ability to associate and therefore come up with an idea. So this first one about questioning, it's really interesting because it seems such a simple thing to do. Question the status quo. And, and for me, um, what it actually does is not only do you question the status quo, but you actually gain an understanding of what the problem is and it isn't. We often talk about um, brainstorming sessions and, and that's trying to solve for the problem um, or come up with a solution to the problem out of the gate where what you could do is flip that on its head and have question storming sessions because then you're able to frame the problem much more succinctly then move into brainstorm sessions. So it is something that we don't use, you know, we don't do actively in that regard. It is um, challenging the status quo and it is imposing constraints. You know, the, the, a classic example would be, what if I could not sell to the same customers today, tomorrow? If I can't sell to the customers I have today, tomorrow, what, what would we do? It's a great way to drive it. Or if I had unlimited money, what would I build? It's a way of just providing, you know, putting the, that's the, the bookends, so to speak, around this. But you know what's really interesting is the status quo, um, challenging the status quo is not easy. Depends, it's a very cultural thing. Certain Arabic cultures, certain Asian cultures do not challenge elders. That's the status quo. So it's not something that is natural to everybody. I will tell you from a very American perspective is we tend to challenge the status quo. We'll challenge whoever, but that's not a cultural, uh, that's not a unique cultural thing uh, globally from that perspective. The other area what you've got to do is, is uh, around observe. And in Inuit actually, the, the CEO of Inuit, and I'm blanking on his name, he, um, he had a fundamental thing. What he would say to people is, what, if you observe something, he would ask the question, was, it, was this different from what you expected? It's a simple question. That's uh, so what he'd say to someone. Was it different from what you expected? If it was, what? And then it starts the conversation. But what's really interesting is it's, it's observing, you, you know, when you're thinking about what, from an observation perspective, it really is about opening, opening your eyes. Here's a little, another little factoid. If you've lived in two plus countries, you've worked in two or more industries, you're twice as likely to innovate because you have a different perspective. You've actually seen how people have approached different problems. It gives you much more experience about how you're going to uh, solve a particular problem. So observation, so when you think about observing, it really is that keeping your eyes open, getting insights from how, how others solve problems in the world. I know when I first started coming to the US was in the mid 90s. And the reason why I did it, I was working in diagnostics at that point, and the reason why I did it was I was building a lab down in Australia, and, and I wanted to come to the US simply because I realized they had the same problems as we did down there, but they had a different approach to solving them because their own, from their cultural perspective and in their own unique experiences, we were able to have a share of ideas and, then, and, and actually help drive innovation, particularly in, in the labs that I was working in down there. So it is something where observ observing the world around you and questioning you know, what you see is a key attribute around when you think about from a behavior to innovate. Amazon's really interesting because, you know, experimenting is, 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 is one of the fundamental attributes, particularly in science. Develop a hypothesis, experimental plan, drive the experiment. What did you get? Was it, what, was it consistent with your hypothesis? If not, what, what, was, what was the cause for the change? And, and really what we find is, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos is an interesting gentleman because he, um, he talks about going down blind alleys. You have to go down blind alleys if you want to find yourself in a different part of the, of the city, in a new part of the city, as he talks about it from that perspective. But he's an extremely uh, prolific in, uh, experimenter. He sets up a number of experiments. And one of his key things was he wanted to drive down the cost of experimenting at, at Amazon, and he actually does this, because he wants to brute force the experiments. He wants to be able to move from 100 to 1,000 experiments because, you know, more shots on goal means I have more opportunities to, to actually find that innovation, um, you know, uh, source that then they can build a new business or a product around. So we know that, so we know that questioning, we know observing, we know experimenting. The other part of it, um, so again, more around experimenting being, you know, as we said, build a hypothesis, test it, and, and what changed. But you typically do it 
when you can't get it through questioning, observing or networking. And networking is a key thing for us as we start to think through how we expand our horizons, particularly at this company. And, and it actually is about talking to people and searching for new ideas. There's this great book that says, never eat alone. And the one thing that I would say is, change it to this. Never eat alone with someone who thinks like you. As humans, we tend to want to associate with people who are like us versus having you know, differences and so forth. So it is something that, from a networking perspective, you need to get out of your comfort zone. You need to be able to do that. So what I'd like to leave you with is, when we think about our ability to be inventive and creative, there are behaviors that certainly I push for the team here, which is we certainly need to question, observe, experiment. And we do that as a natural thing from a scientific perspective, but the one area where we're working hard on is networking and how we look at that through our um, interactions both within the community, but more importantly, we have a lot of our folks that do travel and get into customers. We, my R&D team spends about 25% of their time on the road. We want to get in front of customers and see how they're using our products, what their issues are, bringing back those ideas. I think that's actually a key attribute of why we're fairly inventive at this site. So with that, I'll leave it there and happy to answer any questions. Thank you.